What is up guys, Mark Sixma here with another track breakdown video. My remix for When in Rome by Gattuso and Damon Sharp has reached over 10 million plays. Absolutely crazy. Thank you so much for uh, streaming it, by the way. And to celebrate this, I thought let's do another track breakdown. I'll take you through the whole project and show you how I did the remix. Before we do, please remember to subscribe to the channel and leave a like if you enjoy this video. Now let's dive into the project. Let's go. So the plan today is first I'm going to be uh, showing you guys how I made my remix for When in Rome. I'll be doing a track breakdown, just uh, going over the remix, how I came to do it and, uh, you know, show you the project file, basically. So first, let me just uh, play uh, the track for you a little bit. And then afterwards, we will just go down and, and break it down step by step, all the sections. My remix for When in Rome by uh, Gattuso and Damon Sharp. If you have any questions, then uh, also drop them in the chat. I'll be happy to reply to anything. Also, Joella Music, thanks for the sub. Orishan as well, two months. Froglord, thanks for the 50 bits. Oh. How many elements are in the track? Let, let's see. My computer is uh, getting a little excited. My backup. Mm. I guess it was my backup. So I'm counting 63 different channels. Maybe I have muted one or something. Yeah. So 62. There you go. If you guys heard this track, by the way, I think it's my most streamed track, most streamed track of all time so far. Over 8 million plays already on Spotify. Let's make a promise we won't spend the night alone. Techno beats has <laughs> 66 channels. Yeah, we might jump right off a bridge and break a bone. When in Rome, or oh, when in Rome, let's make a promise we won't spend the night alone. We gotta give in to the night and sing along. Adam, thanks for the sub, man. Welcome to the channel. Achilles 69 channels. Yeah, you guys are getting all dirty already. <laughs> Oof, I'm definitely going to talk about the layering of the leads. I have crazy many layers. It'll maybe a bit too much. It's fun because I haven't opened the project in a while as well, so. Let's see what we uh, come across. And there we go. That's the that's the whole remix. This vocal, this remix came about uh, because Armada asked me to do one on a short notice. In the end, I think I had to do it in between touring. So I had probably two days to work on it. So it was a bit of a rush job, but the original was already so good that it came quite easy. Let me play a little bit of the original as well. So you, you guys see what I actually brought to the table. There we go. That's the original. So that whistle is kind of the, the lead sound in their version. Very chill. So, uh, you know, if you want a club banger, 
you come to me. So that's what they did. They wanted a, a banging club mix. So that's what I uh, brought to the table. I only think I got the, the vocals all together in one. Usually you get some different stems. So the, all the effects are already on. It's just one channel. Normally I would treat that separately. But I think I only got this. Put some reverb on it. Arts Acoustic Reverb, my go-to reverb. Let's make a promise we won't spend the night alone. The Pro-L to uh, limiter to give it a little extra gain. And then uh, some slight side chaining, barely hearable. Not that much. Just to make it fit in the track a little bit better. And these vocal chops was, were also already in the original, but I edited them. At least I put this effect over it, that's what I mean. CLA effects, I use this a lot. It's great to, to get like a, a speakerphone effect or something, or a little bit of grit, if you want to bring a little bit of grit to it. So without it, it sounds like this. And with me. Gives it a little bit of extra grit, basically. What's up, John Weber? It's your 37th birthday. Happy birthday, buddy. You came here to celebrate? Have a good one, man. What's up, Paka, Matte, Mat? How's everybody doing? So, uh, vocal treatment was basically uh, almost zero. I, I didn't have to do much. It was already, I, I just got the vocal with all the effects already. So, there wasn't much to be done, just probably some volume automation, which I just did by cutting up the tracks a little bit. And then uh, the main thing, like what I did differently, I needed like a good hook because the, the whistle. I don't think I did anything to that. Oh yeah, just simple filter and a little bit of reverb. So this was like the main lead in the, in the original, but I needed something more powerful, right? So, so I based my main melody, I based it on the whistle, but I brought some extra things to the table. So I, the main, main lead here is actually a super saw chord. So it's basically the chords here. Oh, let me, let me just group these up. I don't know why I cut these up. So here's the, the MIDI. What I usually do, like if you want to fill out the spectrum a little bit, the, the, bring some harmonics basically. So this is basically the, the top melody that you see here. And I put it one octave higher as well. So it's playing on two octaves. And then here is uh, the, the lowest note are the bass notes that are the similar to the, the bass line in the track. And then uh, one fifth above that. I added these notes. So these, these follow the, the bass line. They're always one fifth above the bass line. So that, that's like pretty standard chords. It's like they call it a power chord. If the bass note is A, and then you play a fifth, which is an E, uh, then that's the power chord essentially. And the melody is just this, this top one that I have playing here. And let, let's count them. I have so many layers in this, uh, in this case. So layering is, is uh, actually essentially what you do when you create, uh, want to create a bigger sound, you know? If one sound doesn't cut it, you can fill it out with different sounds, basically. So I always pick one main one, and in, in, in this case, it's this lead. But because I play chords, I cannot use portamento. Portamento is when you glide from one note to the other. It's, it's what you hear here.
It goes to Wurde instead of to Tete. So that's basically portamento. You do that by extending one note into the other. So the, the moment where they're overlapping, it will actually glide from one to the other pitch instead of just starting on the other pitch. So that's a nice way to give it a little bit of flavor. And I did that with, with quite a few layers. And keep in mind, when you're layering, some of the lead sounds might sound really bad by themselves, but when you put them in the mix, they can sound really good together. A great example is this one. It's like a detuned square wave. Sounds pretty bad by itself, right? So I would never use this by itself, but if you put it together with the chords, already sounds better, right? Just gives a nice little bit of edge to the track. And a mono lead here as well. Always good to put some mono signal in there as well. Oh, there's a, like a little pew sound. I'll show you how I use that later. Then there's, uh, well, basically another three layers. <laughs> I'm going crazy here. So this is the whole lead group, basically. And, and all of them, they go into one group. Uh, because I'm applying a, sort of a stutter effect, if you listen closely. So here I automated this. Um, these little spikes here and here, they are the stutter effect basically. So let me, if I turn off the, well, if I, if I played it with the automation, I deal with the LFO tool. So, um, so basically it's going like 1 16th rate, which is causing like the, the quick stops. Let me tweak this a little bit and then you'll see what I do. So right now it's off. And if I put this on 100%, then it basically makes very short cuts. So you only hear like the, the blue part of it basically. If I would extend this a little bit, you get this. But I just want that very short one. I just wanted to create that little bit of a gate effect that uh, that I also use in Million Miles, for instance, just to give it a little bit of uh, a bit of movement. And so I didn't want to do that manually for each track, so that's why I put all of them in in one group, in one bus. It's called the the group lead. And I, and I edited there, so that's the easiest way to do it. And there's also some, uh, like in the build-up, there's also some filtering going on and some re extra reverb. You can hear it here. So I don't have to tweak all those manually. So there's some automation going on as well towards the drop, and I don't have to manually tweak each channel. Which uh, in this case, because I have so many different layers, uh, that would have taken a lot of time. And I only had one or two days, I, I forgot, but uh, I was limited in time. So that came in very handy. Uh, but those are not all the layers. I also have some layers of uh, piano playing the main theme, especially like a little bit later here, the second time around. and some strings. Also, when I introduce the theme in the beginning, it's just a piano, like a bit crush piano, I think, or, oh no. Oh, it's just a regular piano. But with pizzicato strings. Pizzicato means like uh, very fast strings. It's not plucked, but it's like very fast strikes. So they touch and go, basically. Um, and those I get from Nexus. Uh, it's called uh, the Hollywood Expansion. 
and I use in this case I use the the Giga Spicato in the string section. Really good, uh, useful sounds. Usually, when you want to implement a, a real instrument into a electronic music piece, it's quite difficult to fit it in because it doesn't sound so loud and upfront as um, a software synthesizer. So usually you have to do quite a bit of tweaking, but in this case, this, this library is already sounds pretty good by itself. Let, let me see if I did some extra things. Oh, I, I barely did anything. I did some EQing. Okay, so there's two EQs. One is in, in Cubase itself and one is the Pro-Q. I use this one a lot, to be honest, Pro-Q. You can get very precise with this, but I basically, I boosted like some of the mids, some of the highs here, and I cut, cut away most of the low end and a little bit of the, the mid lows as well. And then uh, in addition to that, I brought on another reverb, the Arts Acoustic, my favorite reverb plugin. Uh, and basically sounds like this. Bring some organic feel to the track. So I always like to, well, not always. That's what I like to do. I like to bring organic instruments to the mix as well. So if you count those, and I have about 10 layers, I think, of lead. And then you have the, the pew right here. That's just to, to, to emphasize the, the one, basically. Because there's no melody playing right there. So it's just filling up that space, basically. And then I add some other layers. I named this one Lead Don because it sounds a little bit like something Don Diablo would use, I guess. <laughs> Lucas, I have so many tracks and it still sounds very good. It's hard to do. Well, uh, the thing is, if you add another layer, um, it, you don't have to listen to it by itself. You just want to see or listen uh, if it makes a difference to the whole signal, right? So if it, if it doesn't bring anything else to the table, you don't want to add it because it's only going to clutter up your space. And a very good idea is as well to remove some of the frequencies that you don't need so that each lead you add will only will be like very audible in a specific part of the frequency. So it maybe it has like a nice little bit of noise that you want in the high end, but you don't really need the mid section of it, right? So when you're mixing, it's always try to give everything, each element its own space. I mean, it's not always possible and you don't always need to do it. But um, if you're layering tracks, then it's always a good idea to cut away as much as you can, you know? Um, I'm not sure actually, because this was quite a rush job for me, um, as I explained earlier, let me look at the, <clears throat> the mixing. I haven't actually done that much of EQing here on the main one on uh, the chords. Yeah. I removed some of the, the low and added a little bit of the mid low, uh, here I emphasize some of the highs, but all in all, I didn't do much EQing, which normally I would recommend, but uh, you know, if it sounds good. There's no need to do it, but it can be pretty tricky uh, when you start out. So uh, be sure to not go crazy because it's very easy to ruin your song if you throw in just too many layers. And I think in this case, I already, uh, I think I copied some of the, the lead sounds I had in my track Million Miles, which were working really well together. So I already knew like some of them were going to work well together. So it's not going to clash, but it can go very wrong as well. Silvela Music, show us how you create a huge lead like your beautiful track Escape With Me. Uh, I think the, the main lead in, in, in Escape With Me is also a super saw, similar to the one here. But, uh, but, but a bit more detail. This one sounds a little bit cleaner than that actually. If you want to dirty it up, you just go crazy on the detune. That's a bit too much, probably. So basically, the, the trick is um, get 
two saw forms here, one here, one here. As many voices as possible. In 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 silence, you can get a maximum of eight voices on each oscillator. So, yeah, I have uh, four different oscillators. They're all saw form. They're all eight voices. They're all detuned. And you can also like it's good to maybe change the fine a little bit. So if you move that left or right, you can you can make it a little bit. It it will be a little bit out of tune, but not so much that you hear it. So it gives that nice, wide, big sound that I also use on uh, Escape With Me. Yurtza official, what's your secret sauce for getting your kick sub bass relationship so fat and clean? All right, let's say, uh, I think we'll, we'll go into the, the bass section in a little bit, little bit. So I'll show you how I did that. Adam, do the layers of lead come from Silent One? Uh, a few of them do. I think mainly Adventure and uh, Silent One in this case, but... Normally I use a lot of Spire as well, and uh, uh, Serum of course, Massive, also use that quite a lot, especially for trance. But yeah, Silent One is a, is a very easy to use synth. It's probably my go-to synth if I want a particular sound very fast, because it's quite easy to use and I, I've worked with it so much. But if you want to go in depth with a little bit of more modulation, then Serum is amazing as well. As there are a lot of great wavetables as well, so... Um, my probably my favorite synth right now is is serum for sarah is it normal to use many different synths or is that just because not all the synths have the presets you want each synth has its own sound sort of say or its own parameters that are not overlapping with the others so if you're looking for something specific you can usually find it in in different synths but for the majority it, it you know you can get a lot of good sounds out of all of them it's just some work in a slightly different way you know so uh, if you want a very particular effect, you might not be able to get it with one synth, but you can get it in another one. Like out of all the synths, I think Serum is probably the most complete one. The VPS Avenger is also very versatile. You can get a lot of sounds with that. But for some reason, it always takes so long. Like if I open the plugin, it's, it takes so much time for it to open. I think it's a CPU hawk, so I, I don't use it that much because it takes a lot of uh, processor power. And when I when you make a track with uh, 63 different, well, it's not all synth tracks, of course, but it's gonna take a lot of your uh, CPU power. All right, let's look into the the bass, right? Um, kick bass is, is always it's it's one of the hardest things to mix. Um, so the biggest tip I have for that, the easiest solution is side chaining. So you side chain the bass to the kick, which means as soon as the kick plays the sub ducks in volume. So they're not clashing because they're never really playing at the same time. So here's my bass group and the kick is over here. I also always put them close together because you know, it's getting them to work together is very important. And also a great tip, like if you have like a very uh, busy bass line uh, that's, that's taking up a lot of space, then usually a, a short kick is a good idea. Like you see here, the kick is not that long, not that subby. Pretty short, short and sweet. You can see here the waveform. So that's all pretty easy, right? I think I got it from a cashmere pack. On splice, usually I like now I get most of my samples on splice. To be honest, I just I know what I'm looking for and then I search for it and then you you'll find it usually. So that's the kick. Um, so it's pretty short and punchy. I don't think there's much processing on it. Oh wait, there is quite a bit. Okay, I did some uh, some compressing. This is uh, one of my favorite compressors, the VSC2. Uh, there's a preset called Kick Drum Fat Compression. <laughs> I guess I just picked that. Normally, I don't process my kick that much, to be honest. Okay, let me play without first. And with. It's not doing that much, to be honest. I don't hear much of a difference. Um, one of the tricks I do, if you uh, also, if you watch my tutorial on YouTube, I'm explaining this trick. Uh, a very easy trick to make your kicks a little bit more punchy is to add like a spike in the high end, a very narrow spike. So that's what I'm doing over here. Uh, I created this very narrow spike. Like if you do it broader, it's like this, right? This is normally how you see it. But for this trick, you want a very narrow bandwidth. It's now at plus five dB. 
I'll exaggerate the effect, right? So. So that's with width and without. But it's, you know, it, it creates a little bit of a sharp edge. You don't want to do it too much because it will, you know, take away some of your headroom on your kick. But it's a nice way to make it a little bit sharper and that will help it cut through the mix as a whole. You can also, you know, there's different things you can do. Just watch the YouTube tutorial. I have like four different techniques. This is the quickest one, but not necessarily the best one. So uh, bear that in mind. So that's basically the kick. And then here's the, the group bass. Let me see how I process that. That's a weird shape. I don't know why I have that. Let me, let me listen to it. I don't think it's doing anything. No, so here I uh, sidechained all the bass lines separately. Uh, let me play all the layers, right? So with the bass line, I do kind of the same as with the, with the leads. I pick one main sound and then I'll work from that. So what I'm missing in that main sound, sound I will add in different layers. I'm not 100% sure if this is the main one. I guess so. This is like... Again, silent one. Bit of a detuned saw bass. Here's the pattern. And you'll hear the glide effect as well here, right? Like, Dew. so you overlap this note with the low one. So it goes down one octave, but it doesn't go from octave straight to the other one. It takes a little bit of time to go there. So that's what, what you call like a glide or portamento effect. So it, it creates a nice, nice bit of movement. And I do that on the one, right? <laughs> because in, in at, at the first beat, there's no melody yet, so you need to come up with something creative. Um, so I, I use that, the glide, and also like this, this serum edit. Just to make it a little bit special, because I was missing something, so I needed to add something, so that's what I did. So this is the main layer, and then I have another here. This is like very... The VPS Adventure, very, very raw sounding, right? A little bit more like electro or even dubstep. Just to make it a little bit more dirty. And then of course there's a sub layer, which plays only the, the lower frequencies. Very important. This is the hardest one to mix with your kick. I have a quadra fuzz on here, it's like a multi-band distortion unit. Even though it looks like I'm not doing much, if I turn it off. It just sounds fatter with it on, it's, it's crazy. Even though it's not supposed to do anything, only in the low here a little bit, it just makes it sound a little bit fatter. And you can only, unfortunately you can only use this plugin in Cubase. And actually I had to... Uh, hack my own Cubase because it doesn't allow 32-bit plugins anymore, the new Cubase. So I overrid it with the file from Cubase 7. Uh, and now I can use my 32-bit plugins uh, still, like the quarter fuss. It's This is the main reason why I'm doing this. So I can still use that in my new version of Cubase, which I shouldn't be able to, but uh, luckily the programmers allowed that. And there's a bit of EQing going on, so I'm rolling off the lows I don't need and then remove a little bit of the the peak of the the kick so the the, the track is in uh, you can see here in the in the notes the track is in, uh, in g sharp or a flat actually um so i removed the frequency that are corresponding with that so that the kick has that part basically so they're not clashing at that point um because i have a tonal kick which is in the same key as well uh, that's a great tip if you want to make them work sound nice together be sure that your uh, kick is in the root key as well that will definitely already help and then there's some some shy chaining going on here uh, pretty long curve so it takes about half a beat to go up here to the max so first it's like completely zero well not completely because it's only on 65 percent here um 
So then the kick and the sub together sound like this. It's like it's a it's like an acoustic guitar, right? Like an acoustic bass guitar. See the frequencies here. So when the kick is playing, usually it, it ducks a little bit, so that that creates a nice vibe. Then I have another bass guitar lead um, layer here, which is a little bit more high. I boosted the highs a little bit to create a little bit of emphasis here. And then I add the edit here as well. So that's basically how I layered my bass. And usually when I group my bass, I will add something like a, a bus compressor on it to glue everything together. Uh, in this case, I didn't do that. Not sure why, but I think it was already working right now and I didn't have much time. So, you know, if it ain't broke, don't try to fix it. Joel, can I show the bass LFO tool? Uh, yeah, sure. From the sub bass, you mean? It's pretty standard curve, right? This is how I norm normally curve my bass lines. You, you can move like how fast it goes up or delay it a little bit, but I like this kind of curve instead of like just this. I usually do it like this. Personal preference. That's the nice thing with the LFO tool. You can like shape it how you want it. And you have the visual feedback, right? If you use a compressor, you're dialing some knobs, but you don't know exactly what it's doing. So here you have a very clear representation of what you're doing. That's what I like about the LFO tool. And you can use it for different things. You don't, it's, you're not, uh, it's not only for volume automation or something. You can also do panning or filter. It's a very simple, but very versatile tool. So that's the base basically. Did I miss any questions? Uh, let, let me check back. Vision, do I mix in headphones? That's a very good question. Um, when I mix, the final mix of the track, so usually when I'm working, I'm either working, usually I work on speakers, uh, but I also like working on the, these headphones, the DT880s. Uh, they're very comfortable, they're, they're very light. You usually like if I work on headphones after two hours, my ears start to hurt, but with these I can just keep going for hours. You know, your speakers are not positioned like headphones. Uh, and also there's not much bleed over, you, you don't hear much from the right ear in your left ear, but with speakers, I hear what's coming from the right monitor in my left ear as well. So it's a different uh, stereo spectrum. So I, when I'm mixing, I like to mix both on headphones and on speakers. Um, usually headphones are great for uh, noticing like very small things that are off. You know, if something, if there's maybe uh, like a click somewhere or there's a, like some random noise somewhere, you won't pick it up on your monitors, but with your headphones, you will pick it up easier. All right, let's, uh, let's have a look at the mastering chain. Everybody always wants to see the mastering. To be honest, I played this track without my mastering chain just to t test it out before, and it sounds so bad. Uh, you can hear it was a rush job, right? So when I made the track, I only work with my mastering chain already on. Uh, if you don't master your own tracks, you don't want to do that, but... Uh, since I master all my own tracks, usually I can get away with it. So I have this chain that I usually tweak for each different track. So first off, is uh, this is the thing that's doing the most, uh, the Ozone 5. Oh, there's a little bit of EQ. Like This is like very small things. Like <laughs> it's almost one, it's not even one dB. So you can not even notice this basically. Um, but the, the main thing is here is the, the multi-band compressor. So here you can compress each layer differently. And I, I use it to, to basically tone in the lows. So the low frequencies aren't getting out of control. That's what I do here. I'm not doing that much to the mid, but the, the high end, I'm just uh, bringing up the high end a little bit. Let me, let me show you like the individual bands, what they do. So if I bypass the low, You hear it starting to clip already? So I just use the low to, to keep it in check a little bit more. All right, let me go a little bit further back. 
So I'm bypassing now the highs. Let me play it on the drop, you'll hear the... And now I'm gonna activate them. Especially this one, like the super high. I'm bringing that up a lot because I was missing quite a bit of that. So basically I'm using the, the multiband compressor just to keep the low end in check and then in, in boost the, the highs a little bit here. Um, there's a bit of stereo imaging um, as well. Here I make the, this is the stereo width, right? So the, the low frequencies I make a little bit more mono and here the high ones I make a little bit more stereo. So that's usually how you want to spread your spectrum, right? The low end usually want to keep that a little bit in the middle. And then the higher you go in frequency range, then the more stereo you can have. There's no real rules, you know, if it sounds good, it's good. But that's how most tracks are being mixed and mastered. Then I have a little bit of EQ going on. Cut, cut some of the, on the lows I don't really need that are just taking up bandwidth. So remove as much of that as you can. And I removed some of the, high, the super high frequencies as well. So it's not that sharp. Here, next one up is a Shadow Hill. It's a mastering compressor. Uh, I like the sound of it. I don't think it does that much, honestly. Just a little bit of flavor. Let me play with. This is with. And without. With. It just sounds a little bit fatter with this one. I'm not going into detail too much because we don't have much time left. Um, mastering is a subject you can spend hours and hours talking about. And here's the, the Manly Massive Passive EQ. Also a UAD plugin. So if you want to use these, you, you're going to need to have an audio interface by UAD. I have the Apollo Twin. So with and without. It's not exactly the same as an EQ, it works slightly different, but you, if you like want to boost, I'm, I'm using it to boost some of the highs and I want to bring a little sparkle to the mix, right? And you don't want to just put a big spike in the EQ, you use this tool. It, it works a little bit different. It's, I, don't, I don't have time to really go into detail to explaining it, but I, I use this to make, to bring out the highs a little bit more and in not a sharp way, but more like controlled. But again, this is not doing that much. And then here, finally, I have the invisible limiter. It's my, my favorite uh, limiter. You can get away with uh, boosting the sound quite a bit without it, you know, uh, dis destroying the sound, basically. It has 16 times oversampling, uh, and which helps detect uh, the spikes. And then, yeah, here's the, the input gain. It's just a very clean one. You, you just usually use it with like this on zero. Put this on 16 times oversampling and then usually you're good. Unless you're like really feeding too much, right? L let, me, let me see how far I can go with the volume until it starts distorting. Obviously this depends on your mix, right? As well. Okay, here it starts clipping, right? Here it still sounds clean. But I don't want to push it to the max, right? Especially because this is a more of a streaming track. You don't need it as loud as a club track. So I didn't go that crazy, but I mean, you know, just do what you, what you feel like, you know, for, uh, of course, with Spotify, they're going to turn down the, the LUFS anyway. So the volume is going to get turned down anyway. Um, so even if you, you buff it up to the max, they're going to cut it down even more. So it doesn't really work that way for Spotify, but for clubs, of course you can just go really loud. Achilles music. Am I doing separate club and streaming masters yet? Um, yes and no. Um, I will usually make a original mix, which is meant for streaming. It doesn't have an intro like this, this version, this is the, this is the original remix. And then I'll make an extended remix. And I'll use slightly different uh, 
mastering on the extended version. So the extended mix and the original mix there, I treat them a little bit differently. Sometimes I change the, the multi-band compressor as well, but usually it's just the limiter, how much I'm feeding into the limiter. Like I'll, I'll tone that down a little bit for the, the original mix. Henry, yeah, the Shadow Hills is great. But, but again, guys, uh, I know a lot of people think, you know, if you buy this compressor, put it on your master, your track is going to sound awesome. It does not work like that. It can help a little bit, but only a little bit. Don't expect miracles, you know, that's... Make sure your mix is okay already and then apply it, then it can have a, a nice effect. Usually, you know, you want to fix your problems already in the mix. So everything you're doing, like with all these channels, you want to make sure you feed into the master bus when everything is already correct. Like for this one, I didn't have the time to do that. So I just uh, work with my mastering chain on the whole process because I was in a rush. Uh, but normally it's up to you. It, it, it can be dangerous to do that. So if you're a beginner, I, I would not recommend using a plugins activated on your master chain already. I would wait with that till you have everything. You got the best mix you possibly can and then start worrying about mastering or maybe even better send it out to a mastering service. Nowadays they're pretty cheap as well. So, but you know, there's a lot of people who say that that's like sacrilege. You don't want to put anything on the, the master chain when you're working on a track. For me, it's just a time saver. That's why I do it. All right. I think we, uh, is there any other questions about the, the remix? I think it's time to jump into the demos, uh, in a few minutes. Froglord, a tip on how to nail arrangement and make a track going interesting. Uh, I mean, there's no really quick tips for it. Um, <clears throat> regarding arrangement, I always feel like the track needs to be exciting at all times, right? So if you, if you listen to the track and you kind of lose interest, um, that's where you want to change something or you want to cut something out. My, my rule is kind of, I always make the tracks as short as possible. Uh, if you don't need it, like a certain section, then remove it. That's uh, because people's attention span, uh, spans right now, these days are quite limited. So if you're going to make your tracks too long, you will lose a big part of your audience usually, especially for streaming, right? So this is a streaming track. So I, I always aim around the three minute mark for that. And because this is a vocal track, you know, it's, uh, it will help because there's the vocal will keep things interesting. The rest is just support. And for arrangement. Yeah. Even if you, if you're new to the, the production game, it's a great way to learn about arrangement is just actually just copying a track you like, put it in your sequencer, just, just open it like, like an, an audio track on top here, and then just listen each eight bars, what they're changing in the arrangement and do exactly the same. If you, you don't, I mean, don't do like the same melody in the same bass line, but say like, okay, here he's going to add a hi-hat, then you add a hi-hat as well. Here he's going to add the bass line, then you add your bass line as well. So you're not copying the track, you're just copying the structure and no one's going to hear that. You know, if you use the same structure as another track, that's not a problem. You, you're going to make your own track. It's just will help you understand how people structure their tracks. Especially when you're making club mixes, it's a different structure because um, in the beginning and the ending, you need some space for the DJ to mix the tracks, right? So you're going to need at least eight bars, preferably 16 bars at least for the DJ to have time to transition the tracks. Alchemist, do I take a song for reference for arrangement or IDs? Um, not really anymore, unless I try a new genre, right? If it's a genre I'm already uh, familiar with, like my own music, of course, I don't need an arrangement because I know how to arrange these tracks. And I kind of came up with my own arrangement. Like I was think was one of the first who did like the big room intro drop, then may drop and then outro drop. No, no one was doing that. So I, I kind of went my own way with that. But when I do a more poppy track, uh, then I definitely listen to arrangements because I'm not so uh, familiar with that territory. So that's when I listen like, okay, how are they structuring their track? So I, even me, I, I, I sometimes do it for sure. If you enjoyed this, be sure to give me a like and subscribe to the channel. That would be much appreciated. Please let me know in the comments below if there's anything else you would like me to talk about in these videos. And maybe I'll cover that topic next time. Also, if you want to see me live in action working on my music or just have a chat, be sure to give me a follow on Twitch. Keep dropping those beats and see you next time.